country. So you look at like Sri Lanka, right? About 10 years ago, when the LTT or 12 years ago, when LTT was finished, you thought Sri Lanka was the next superpower, next economic superpower. A lot of people said that it has a strategic location in the Indian Ocean and uh, they wanted to make Sri Lanka like the next Singapore. And uh, this is where you got the Rajapaksha brothers coming in. So there are a few things which went in, right? So they came into power. They were brutal against LTT. They got peace back. And now you thought, okay, it has the whole roadmap built for uh, fast economic development. And so a lot of times, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So like a few things all went wrong together. So one is you got access to cheap foreign capital. And whenever you get a lot of easy debt, you maybe consume way more beyond your means. So I think that is one thing which has happened in the case of Sri Lanka. A lot of it was also with China trying to get Sri Lanka in its, in its own umbrella. Uh, they gave a lot of these cheap loans under BRI with all caveats attached. So there, uh, now uh, you saw like the Rajapaksha brother led by Mahinda. They said, oh, let's build a world-class port in the city of Hambantota, where they are from. Instead of like adding capacity to the existing Colombo port. So this was like a few white elephant infrastructure projects which they built in, where while you're getting financing quite cheap, you build a lot of hardware, maybe the wrong location, where you do not have the existing human capital or what I would call the software. So that is like a little bit incompatible. So that is, then it doesn't pay for itself. You cannot drive a F1 car on roads of Mumbai, right? So, uh, <laughs> and then you have to pay up for it. So that that is what has happened. Then the third one, is led by a lot of these NGOs and whatnot, they went on a drive to make all farming organic. So while organic farm, farming is good, it's all like a crop yields fall in half. So you have the right intentions in mind, but sometimes your execution is like faulty. Maybe they could have done it as an experiment in some places and then rolled it out widely. So that was bad. And then finally, you had uh, a lot of tourists coming into Sri Lanka. It's a very lovely place. I visited it due to COVID. When the tourism collapsed, that was like the straw which broke the camel's back. So Sri Lanka already was fragile for a lot of reasons, right? And sometimes what happens is when the last straw which adds and then, you know, breaks the camel's back, uh, this is what has happened. And also we need to realize, we India needs to learn a bit from this, right? So one is, yes, uh, you need a lot more infrastructure, definitely. But can we finance it domestically? Uh, two is, can we be a little more... Uh, sensible about where the infrastructure is being built. For example, like the whole Hamban Tota port probably was a white elephant. India should focus on connecting its bigger cities, maybe focus on urban infrastructure earlier, which kind of raise, re, uh, increases tax collections and like pays for further uh, social welfare in the rural part, probably. You need to be focused, like where is the biggest marginal impact of what you borrow? Then lastly, like India was smart about not being part of Belt and Road Initiative because what has happened there is you take a lot of loans, but then it doesn't generate local employment. A lot of the workers were Chinese, the contractors were Chinese. So the money comes in as debt and then becomes equity for some other Chinese companies. So money flows back out and you are left holding the bag in case. So if everything goes fine, your economic growth grows a lot, etc. That's a win-win situation. But a lot of times, as we know in life, like something, a speed bump comes and it gives you a shock. But is this shock enough to derail you? So you need to be resilient. And so not be dependent on only one source of revenue for like uh, Sri Lanka, it was tourism. And so a lot of these things have come into play. And uh, hopefully, I think India should help out its neighbor. India has done some of those uh, uh, loans. They've given some credit lines to Sri Lanka. Uh, India needs friendly neighbors in its backyard. And we need to like look at this again. Let's see how can India help and also get India, uh, Sri Lanka back as an Indian ally because it has a strategic location for India. And uh, there is learning for us as well, where like a lot of state CMs, etc., are being very profligate and like promising a lot of freebies, right? Sri Lanka did the same and you got growth in the short run, but at you have to pay it back at some point, right? So you've got to be sensible about how you spend your money. And uh, this is a learning for most emerging markets. Uh, India has been like a little more resilient. India has A, a large country, B, like a diversified economy. So from like software exports, manufacturing, etc. Maybe India does very badly on tourism. So India needs to see, oh, how can we learn and like improve tourism, right? So all those kind of things. So yes, a few things for India to learn. And also it is a kind of template what, what we should not follow or be prepared for shocks as and when they come so that we don't get derailed the same way Sri Lanka has. See, what they thought was they put the chicken and egg wrong. Like they said that uh, if we cut taxes to the level, say of like a 
finance hub like Singapore, uh, we will get all the investment that Singapore has, right? Or Dubai. They want to be something like a Singapore or a Dubai, or that's what Rajapaksha's thing was. But without having the necessary attracting all the human capital that these cities attract, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that was also, as I said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Probably the intentions are all good. And uh, you mentioned, see, it is a democracy where you had Rajapaksha, then he lost election, Sirisena came in, then Sirisena lost election, Rajapaksha came back. So not trying to say that, oh, like blaming it on any one person. So see, the way out in all of these things has always been that uh, you kind of, so they've already done that you devalue your currency first, helps exports a bit. Uh, you try and like attract investments uh, from countries where you believe which generates local employment, not where like a factory set up and Chinese workers come and set up. Second thing is, yeah, the tourists were like Russia, Ukraine and Chinese and China is all shut because right. of Omicron and they're, they're not allowing people to come back without quarantine or leave easily. So their tourism I board needs to attract yeah. a lot more other people. So maybe get that. Uh, Nasim Taleb has a checklist of like five things which causes like a country to be fragile. So one is uh, too much power concentrated in like a few people. So nobody tells them that, oh, you're doing a wrong policy, okay. right? Correct. That is one. So Sri Lanka had that. Uh, two is being a one-trick pony that you all your income is only from one source and it's not diversified. So shock to one economy or one sector wipes you out. So that was again true with Sri Lanka. Three is very high debt, right? That is also true with Sri Lanka. <laughs> then number four is how many times have they had like transitions in power, etc. which is okay. So Sri Lanka has fed reasonably okay. On. Yeah, so that has been okay. And then uh, like the fifth one is uh, that you're over-reliant on uh, say some key critical imports. Uh, obviously, like a lot of the South Asian nations, Southeast Asian nations are uh, reliant on imports for energy or you have like somebody has hold over you, right? Or say China Even because of its debt had a hold over their policy. So I think these, like look at this checklist. So here you have to try and see how can this be strengthened. And I don't think that you need somebody from the IMF telling Sri Lanka what to do. Probably Sri Lanka needs to learn from itself that what went wrong, have an honest assessment and try and reach out to allies like you think of like say countries like Japan or South Korea and have like a wider set of people who come and invest in Sri Lanka, right? right? right. Uh, second thing is Sri Lanka is very sparsely populated. So it's not like other South Asian nations. It has only a population of 20 million. So it cannot be like a manufacturing super hub. So those things as well that you put in a lot of big ports doesn't mean that trade is going to pick up. Maybe it will be a transshipment hub, not like a manufacturing hub which ships out everything into the rest of the world so i think that also chinese investments and chinese banks will hurt because of this as well they've expected that everywhere build and they will come because china had a lot of their uh, human capital or the manufacturing expertise that we built bigger ports more trade would happen this hasn't happened in case of sri lanka so i think they have to have an assessment themselves uh, rather than anyone advising them that what went wrong what what can be done better 